Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good. Sounds like you guys are good. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the same boat, but I mean, we're almost there. We have like another month left. But yeah, for this morning, I have two announcements from Aubrey and Madison. And I'm not sure if um, Devin needs to make an announcement too, but if you need to make an announcement too, Devin, you can make one. But after that, we have a video to show you guys for next week's speaker. Okay, I just wanted to um, reiterate a little of what we talked about in the chapel last week. Um, this Thursday night, we're having an all-night prayer and worship from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., which sounds like a lot, but the Lord gives strength. Um, but it's going to be focused on the life of Jesus and walking through the story of the cross from his birth all the way until his resurrection. And it'll be a really good time. There will be snacks, there will be coffee, and um, it's always a really good time of worship. There's not a chapel credit involved, but it's always been a huge blessing um, every year we've been able to do it. So, come out. Oh, it's at Grace Fellowship, um, which is like five minutes up the road. If you need help getting there, we can take away. So, just come find me or something. Hey, everybody. My name is Madison. I'm a part of the volleyball team here at TFC. Um, I wanted to let you all know that we're hosting a tournament on April 29th at 5 p.m. Um, it's to support our team. We're trying to raise some money. So if you guys could make a team, even if you don't play volleyball, that would be fantastic. It's really just to have a good time. Um, of course, we're going to be competitive, but, you know, whatever. Who cares? So you guys just come out, make a team, and there's more information in your student emails. So just be looking for that. And if you have any questions, you can ask any of the girls in the volleyball team, and we'll be glad to answer. Thanks. I get asked the question all the time, uh, when is the best time to go see a counselor? To which I reply, when is the best time to treat cancer? It's the moment that you notice you have an issue. Sometimes we wait till it's way too late in the game to go get help, to open up, to talk to somebody about our struggles. And I know what it's like. Because, especially as a man, and I like to think I'm a macho man, um, I, I didn't want to talk about the issues that I had. I didn't want to admit to people that I was struggling or I doubted myself or I had insecurities. Those were like weak words for whips. Um, those wasn't real macho man words. But the more that I bottled that in, the, the more that I would either explode on other people or implode and go through this dark this spiral of depression where I didn't want to live anymore. And so the best time to get help is the moment you start having thoughts about insecurity, is the moment that you start having thoughts about not liking yourself. The best time to treat cancer is when you find it, and the best time to open up about your depression is when you think it. Awesome. Um, how about we stand to our feet? Uh, I want to give you guys this time to just be in prayer. Um, for myself, I am a little bit nervous. Um, so I pray that you would pray for me uh, and uh, the team up here, but also uh, to pray for yourselves. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like this overwhelming weight has been just coming from thinking about Passover. And that's what this week is. Uh, and this coming Sunday is Resurrection Sunday for us. And so I want to give you guys this time to just be in prayer, uh, to set your hearts in a posture of worship, because that's what our God deserves. So go ahead and take this time to pray for yourselves. Heavenly Father, we come before you and for myself, God, I am just pondering Pondering what Jesus, what Jesus went through. And I know that he understands me, but at the same time, God, I don't understand the overwhelming weight that he went through this entire week, this Passover week before he was crucified. He must have been scared, he must have been afraid like me this morning, God, but I pray that you would be honored because I know that's what Jesus did. He honored and he glorified you. So 
I pray that God, we would do that this morning. We lift up all the praise, all the glory, all the honor to you. It is in your name that we give thanks and we pray. Amen.
sing that chorus one more time. Just our voices. Because of what your son has done for us, the debt he has paid, we give you the praise and the honor this morning, God. We lift your name on high. Now, God, people said, Amen. You may take a seat. Good morning, TFC. Especially at this time of the semester, as professors, we're oftentimes wondering, just like you are, how are we going to make it to the end, and, and why do we do all this? And one of the uh, privileges that we have as professors is to get to know students, to begin to walk beside them, uh, to see them grow and mature in their faith, and then eventually for them to walk across this platform and go out into the world and engage the world for Jesus Christ. And that is incredibly fulfilling whenever we get to see that happen. And today, your student chaplain, Andrew Tao, is one of the uh, students that I've had uh, the opportunity to walk beside uh, in classes, as well as our work together with uh, the Hmong Student Association. And I am uh, certain that God is going to speak to him this morning. So, Andrew, come and share God's word with us. Woo! I'm not running away, don't worry. <laughs> Hello, just, just, is my mic working? Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hopefully none of you guys hate me because you're gonna see my face for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> or about 30 minutes. And thank you, Dr. Heising, for such kind words, for the wisdom that you've given to me during my time here. And also thank you to Jordan Brown for doing the same as well, pouring into me and watching over me and teaching me what it's like to be a chaplain here. And today's message is not a resurrection message, but I hope and pray that it's one that prepares our hearts to worship God as we think about the resurrection. But before we study God's word today, let us pray. God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for the privilege, Lord, to be here with brothers and sisters, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, to worship you, God. Lord, this morning, as I am going to share your word, I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece, God. Help me to speak accordingly to your word and to preach only your word, God. And if there's anything of me that is uh, trying to gain, if there's any pride in me, Lord, would you take it away? Holy Spirit, would you uh, speak to everyone today, and especially to and so we thank you and pray all this in your son's holy name. Amen. I have a friend who goes to Bible college. He told me that God called him to become a pastor, to do ministry. He's passionate, yeah, but he's arrogant and unmanageable. His whole life he's relied on his talents, his skills, his capabilities. But there's one thing that he lacks, he lacks. And that is character. When he told me that he felt God's calling to use him in ministry, my question to him was, can God really use someone who is arrogant and unmanageable? If so, how, God? Does the Bible say anything about this? 
And as I pondered upon this question, I remembered there's someone else who God used. His name was Jacob, the twin brother of Esau, the son of Isaac, also an unmanageable man. And the question remains the same. Can God really use someone who is arrogant and unmanageable? And if so, how? And to answer this question, we're going to be looking at the story of Jacob, as I'm sure many of you have thought already. Uh, but we're going to key in on his wrestling with God. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis 32, verses 24 to 32. Or your phones, either one is okay. And this is what the word of God says. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. And before we study this passage, it's important that we understand who Jacob was. He was an arrogant and unmanageable man. His name in Hebrew means heel grabber, the one clutching the heel, supplanter, the one who takes that which is not his own through force, scheming. And this was a foreshadow of what his life would look like. Because the moment he was born, he was clutching the heel of his older brother Esau. And we see his name portrayed in his life. And we're going to look at three uh, moments. And the first moment was when he stole the blessing from, when he stole the birthright of Esau. Esau came home from hunting and he was hungry, he was famished. And he saw that Jacob was cooking some stew. So Esau asked for some of the stew. But Jacob, being a heel grabber, being arrogant, tells him, I'll give it to you if you sell your birthright to me. And Esau, being so hungry, doesn't think about it and does so. A second moment was when Jacob stole the blessing from Esau. Isaac had told Esau, my son, go hunt some game. Bring it back, prepare a meal for me. Then I will bless you. Because Isaac was old and could not see and didn't know when he would die, he asked Esau to do so. But Jacob, being a heel grabber once again, him and Rebekah, his mother, make a deceptive plan. Rebekah gives animal skin to Jacob and prepares two young goats, and Jacob brings it to his father. And Isaac, although skeptical at first, accepts this and blesses him in the place of Esau. And when Esau comes back home and he prepares his meal and gives it to his father, his father says, already blessed your brother. And Esau weeps and is bitter and asks, is there no other blessing, Father? And he received an, an inferior blessing to Jacob, as a servant to Jacob all his days. And a third one was when Jacob stole Laban's sheep. He had been serving Laban for 14 years, for, for Leah and for Rachel. But after serving, he wanted to leave, and he wanted to leave with 
well. So he heel grabs once again, takes that which is not his own, and takes the sheep of Laban. And at this point, you're probably wondering, why do you keep talking about Jacob? Why does this matter? It's because when we read about Jacob, when we look at Jacob, the story of Jacob, it's very much like looking into a mirror. Because we also are arrogant and unmanageable. Especially here at TFC, it's so easy to just focus on success, talent, capabilities. It's so easy to be content with what I can do. We're not much different from Jacob, if we are being honest. And it's kind of ironic because TFC is a place where character is to be developed through intellect, right? We hear this model all the time. But it's so easy to get intellect and miss out on it. So we are also arrogant and unmanageable, eager for success. The question remains the same. Can God really use someone who is arrogant and unmanageable? And if so, how does God do this? To answer this question, we're going to key in to Jacob's wrestling with God. Because this story will help us to better understand how this is possible. So how does Jacob get to this point? How does Jacob get to the point where he's wrestling with God? As I said before, Jacob just left Laban and stole his sheep, but now he's at a point where he's trying to return to his father. But there's a problem. He has to cross through the land where Esau is. Esau, who wants to kill him, who hates him, who has a grudge against him, the brother who he stole the blessing from, he has to cross through this land to get to his father. So how in the world is he going to get through this land? How in the world is he going to find favor from Esau so Esau doesn't kill him? But Jacob, he's a heel grabber. He knows what he's going to do. So he comes up with a plan. I'm going to send a gift to Esau, and he'll find favor with me. So he does so. But then he received news that Esau was coming to him with men. So Jacob, being so afraid, reverts to what is natural. Heel grab. So he makes a new plan. I'm going to send two groups this time. The first group is going to be another gift. They're going to go with the gift. And if Esau kills them, I'll be safe with the second group. And he was content with this plan. He was happy about it. This is his master plan. But before he could even execute this master plan, Jacob had an unexpected encounter with a man. Let us read verse 24. It says this. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Jacob has an unexpected encounter with a man. And this man is revealed to be God. It's ironic because in the midst of Jacob planning everything, getting his life together, he has an unexpected encounter with God. And when we hear this, we're kind of confused. Why in the world is God wrestling with Jacob? And why isn't God winning? Like, it's, it's God. He's God. Why can't he win? Is God really all-powerful if he can't even beat Jacob? The problem isn't that God can't be Jacob. God has all the power to use force to beat Jacob. It's like taking candy from a child. But I don't think this is the point of God wrestling with Jacob. I think that God is trying to get Jacob to willingly submit to him as God. If he uses brute force, yeah, Jacob loses. But Jacob doesn't willingly surrender. So in Jacob's deceptive plan, he has an unexpected encounter with God. 
And just like Jacob, for those whom God will use, there is an unexpected encounter with God. I remember this moment for me. When I was in my sophomore year, I had my life planned out. I was going to go to seminary after Tekoa. And then I was going to get educated and then become the best pastor ever. In the middle of my arrogant planning, God put me into a submission home. Put me in a headlock or whatever lock you can think of. He put me in a place where I had to wrestle with his will. Andrew, are you going to do my will or are you going to do yours? Are you going to live according to your plans, your strength, or are you going to surrender? So just like Jacob, there's an unexpected encounter. And just like Jacob, we are arrogant and unmanageable. But the funny thing is, when God challenges, for some reason, we tend to resist even more. Uh, for verse 25, oh, that is until we cannot. Uh, verse 25 says, when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. When God dislocated his hip, when the man dislocated his hip, he realized, I'm not wrestling with the man. I'm wrestling with God. And when he realized that he was wrestling with God, his posture changed. For verse 26 says, Then he said, Let me go. This is the man speaking. Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. When Jacob realized that he was wrestling with God, he wanted something out of it. He still wanted to be the heel grabber, even against God Almighty. Imagine, like, getting your hip dislocated from God and then having the audacity to say, hey, I still want to bless me. Like, you could have died right there. God just dislocated your hip. But your first reaction is, bless me. I mean, Jacob, an arrogant and unmanageable, unmanageable man. Uh, but once again, we're not too much different from Jacob. Here at TFC, often, we want what God gives. We want the blessings of God. We seek out education and skills for our ministry, our careers. But we forget about a relationship. We forget about God's kingdom. We tend to do things for ourselves, especially at TFC here, a place where it's competitive for education. It's competitive to be the best. But we miss out on relationship with God. Education and skills are only meant to help us walk more closely with God as we serve in your career. But we miss this because we are also arrogant and unmanageable, just like Jacob. The question remains the same. Can God really use someone who is arrogant and unmanageable? And if so, how? The story of Jacob continues. Verse 27 says, So he said to him, God said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. In this question that God asked Jacob, Jacob has to be vulnerable and transparent with God. All his life he's been deceiving people, tricking people to get what he wanted. In any other situation, he could have done so. But when he is before the Almighty God, there is no hiding. There is no deceiving the Almighty God. He has to be vulnerable with God. He has to confess, I am Jacob. I am the heel grabber. I am the one who took my brother's blessing. I am Jacob. And once again, when God puts us 
in a submission hold. Puts us in a place of surrender. We have to be vulnerable with God as well. I remember this moment for me. In the midst of my arrogant plan, I was going to carry out my plan. But when God put me in a place of surrender, I had to wrestle against the will of God. Andrew, are you going to do ministry for me? Andrew, are you here at TFC for me? Was I going to surrender to God Almighty? Or was I going to keep resisting? And it was clear. I had to surrender. Just like Jacob had to surrender. And it is in this moment of surrender that God does a transforming work. God begins to transform the one he will use through this surrender. For verse 28 says, he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. In Jacob's defeat against God, in his surrender to God, there God blessed him. There God changed him. And the funny thing about Jacob's defeat here is that his name was changed to Israel. As verse 28 says, and Israel means God prevails. God is victorious. So when someone calls his name Israel, he's reminded, hey, God is victorious. I was defeated by God. And not only that, but his, his hip was dislocated. So in every step he takes, he remembers, I was defeated by God. So in Jacob's defeat, everything that he does, he's reminded of God's victory over him. He's reminded of God in everything he does, in every step he takes. So he remembers God in everything. No longer is it about his strength, because he no longer has the same strength. It's no longer about him being the heel grabber, because he's no longer Jacob the heel grabber. But funny enough, in his defeat, he still wants some sort of victory. Verse 29 says, Then Jacob asked him and said, Please, tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. In the ancient culture, only the superior one can change the name of the inferior one. So Jacob here is trying to be victorious over God. He's trying to be superior over God. Even in the midst of losing already, having his hip dislocated, having his name changed, he still wants to have some sort of victory. But he's not the superior one. And he loses to God. And it's in this defeat that God blesses him there. Jacob doesn't get what he wants. But he gets the opposite. He gets defeated by God. But it's through this defeat that he is blessed. And once again, his defeat, it's one that leaves him forever humiliated. That is, until he realizes this relationship that I have with God is beautiful. Yeah, I've been defeated. Yeah, I don't rely on on my strength to do everything anymore. But it's a beautiful thing. And this is important because the blessing that uh, Jacob once received was through deception. He stole Esau's blessing. But now the blessing that he received was rightfully his. Because it wasn't received through deception. God didn't bless him because he was deceived by Jacob. But God blessed him because he was defeated. The blessing that once wasn't his, he now was blessed with the rightful blessing in his defeat. So Jacob became an heir of the Abrahamic covenant. He became an important figure in fulfilling this Abrahamic covenant. Through this defeat, he was blessed. And just like Jacob was defeated by God, 
for us, even if we wrestle with God, even if we struggle against God, there is no way of beating the Almighty God. God is victorious over us as he was victorious over Jacob. And verse 30 to 32 continues. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. In these verses, we see that Jacob's defeat is not only one that he remembers forever, but also one that his descendants remember forever. As he walks, he remembers his defeat. And as the descendants eat, they remember his defeat. God's victory over Jacob is forever remembered. So through this defeat, what is important is that as Jacob, who once planned to have his master plan to find the favor of Esau, when he goes back to meet Esau, He's not Jacob the heel grabber anymore. He's Israel. The one who was defeated by God and was blessed. And this is important for us because this is where the question is answered. Can God actually use someone who is arrogant and unmanageable? Yes. Can God use me or you, even if we are unmanageable and arrogant? Yes. But how? How does God do this? When God wants to use someone for his glory, he breaks them and leaves them forever changed. That is how. God breaks the one he will use. So that in every step that they take, it's no longer on their strength, but it's on his strength. When God wants to use someone for his glory, he must break them and leave them forever changed. And this is important for us because at TFC, it's so easy to seek success. It's so easy to be content with talent and skills and it's also so easy to miss out on relationship with God. It's so easy leaving here with a degree, but leaving without a relationship with God. When God wants to use someone for his glory, he breaks them and leaves them forever changed. My hope and prayer for us at TFC is this. Even though we're here to be equipped for whatever career, even though we're here to learn, I hope and pray that we would learn to ultimately yield and surrender to God. That in every step that we take in the future, we would no longer rely on our strength, but that we would rely that we would surrender to the God who breaks us and leaves us forever changed. Let us pray. God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the story of Jacob, Lord. As I read about Jacob, Lord, I'm reminded of how arrogant and unmanageable I am. And Lord, it's in the moment of defeat, Lord, that you truly help us, Lord, to be changed. And God, I pray that this message, Lord, is one that is helpful, Lord, that helps us to draw near to you, God, to surrender our life to you, Lord. And God, I pray that as we as students leave from chapel here to go to class, that, Lord, we would be reminded of how great you are, Lord. 
as we leave this place, I pray that we would be in a posture of worship, Lord, of surrender. God, we praise you and we thank you for all that you do. And as we look to Resurrection Sunday, Lord, help us to keep this posture. And so we thank you for all this in your son's holy name.